Hey guys, what's up? I'm Noah, this is Analog Resurgence, and today I'm talking about some tips for success for shooting 35 millimeter photography film. <laughs> 35 millimeter is probably the most kind of accessible film format out there when you're getting into using analog for the first time. 35 millimeter just has a lot to offer and it's pretty easy to use and get into. And there's the widest selection of like facilities that are able to handle this stuff and develop it and get the pictures that you take on the film back to you. I'm gonna talk about 10 tips to keep in mind for better 35 millimeter shooting. Number one, be sure you've loaded your film properly. Don't pull out too much film when you're loading because you lose it the moment it's out of the canister. So when you're loading your film in the camera, it's okay to kind of waste a little bit of film at the beginning. Just make sure that your film is actually caught and moving through the camera properly when you're loading it. And as you're advancing the film in the middle of the roll with the back closed, you can be sure that things are moving right by looking at this piece on the side of a camera like an SLR. It should be turning because the film is moving out of the canister. Number two, try and remember what kind of film you've loaded into your camera. Now, if you're somebody like me, you like to kind of load up a camera or two or three or five, and sometimes maybe you like to stretch that roll out for a little while and shoot it over the course of a month or I mean even a year. But it's really, really useful to try and keep track of what you've loaded into your camera. Now a lot of point and shoot cameras happen to have a little window so you can kind of see inside just at the information on the film canister. And some SLRs have a little window on the back where you can slot in the box piece or some sort of note to remind you to kind of keep track of what you loaded into this camera maybe months ago when you decided to start shooting. But either way, whether it's making a little note on your camera somewhere or something like that, it's really important to kind of keep track of what's in your camera because if you accidentally change the light meter or some other functions on your camera halfway through the roll, then this can kind of change the results that you get. Number three, if you're shooting your film inside a manual camera like an SLR here or like this nice little Hi-Matic here, where you have to set the ISO of the film type that you've put into your camera, then make sure you're taking the time to do that and keeping the ISO on your camera consistent and that it's the right setting for the film that you're putting inside the camera. If you're shooting 400 ISO film, then you should probably put your meter on 400. This changes if you wanna overexpose or underexpose the roll consistently throughout the whole thing, but it's best to make sure that you're setting your ISO meter when you put the roll of film into your camera so that you're shooting the entire roll consistently. Film is not gonna shoot itself a lot of the time. You kind of have to make sure that you're setting your camera the right way in order to shoot the film that you've put into it. Number four, be careful with shooting non-DX coded film inside of automatic point and shoot cameras. I have nothing against point and shoot cameras. I really don't. I love to have a few on hand, but a lot of them use what's called DX coding detection in order to expose the images properly for the film that you're putting inside of them. These are metallic contacts that I've talked about in a previous video as well. And a lot of widely available film has this DX coding on the canister. It just tells the camera the ISO of the film and kind of how many shots you can take on it so that these automatic cameras just kind of know what they're doing with the film that you put inside of them. We live in a wonderful, magical time where there's just a ton of 35 millimeter film out there from different, more obscure companies that don't always have the ability to professionally manufacture the canisters in order to put the film inside of them. So sometimes they use cheaper canisters or just rebranded canisters that don't have the proper DX coating on them. So companies like the Film Photography Project and Film Washi, Revlog and Lomography all sell some different 35 millimeter film that's a little more obscure or unique or just different, but not all of them have really standard ISOs like 100 or 200 or 400 and a lot of them don't have DX coating on the canisters. So they're not always safe to use inside of these automatic cameras. You should probably stick to something that has more manual options like an SLR when you're shooting some of those more obscure films. Number five, do not get your film wet. I can't stress this enough. If you accidentally drop your camera into water or drop a roll of film into water, even if it's all the way back inside of a canister, it can irreversibly damage the film sometimes. Getting the film wet 
can cause the actual film's emulsion, which is the side of the film that stores the image and has all the important layers of the film, can result in it sticking to itself and just damaging it before it goes through the developing process. It can kind of halt the entire process of the lab depending on the machines that they use if you give them some water damaged film and don't tell them first. So if something goes wrong with your roll when you're shooting it, it's usually a good idea to just let the film lab know when you're giving them your film. Number six, very similar to the whole not getting your film wet thing is something called film soup. There's a bit of an experimental trend out there of people soaking their film in foreign materials either before or after shooting their film in the camera. These kinds of foreign materials can definitely infect and damage photochemicals in a professional lab. Now, when I'm talking about film soup and foreign materials, I'm talking about things like ramen water, lemonade, tea, urine, all sorts of just weird stuff. And this stuff can result in really weird kind of experimental and crazy results when the film is actually developed afterwards. But a lot of labs will not develop that film if you've put it into something strange beforehand. Contamination of chemicals and damage to other roles is kind of a big issue with film that has gone through some sort of film soup. So if you're doing something weird to your film like that, again, let the lab know, but also be prepared to develop that kind of film at home by yourself because a lot of labs just won't do it. Number seven, don't open your camera in the middle of a roll of film. This is probably should just be maybe number one, but also it's something that happens. Sometimes by mistake, sometimes because people just don't realize. But film is light sensitive and it's exposed in the camera and it's only exposed to light in the camera when you're taking a picture and the lens opens up for a brief or long period of time and then closes again. So opening the back of a camera in the middle of a roll will ruin the film. You will lose large portions of the film. Number eight, don't backwind your film. Backwinding your film happens when you accidentally go to rewind your film and you turn the little handle on your film camera in the wrong direction. When you're actually looking at the rewind handle of your camera, there's a little arrow and the arrow tells you which way to wind the handle. Wind it the direction the arrow is pointing, not against the arrow. Winding it in the opposite direction of the arrow forces the film back into the canister being wound in the opposite direction that it should be. Ultimately, if you backwind the film, you can end up with really strange artifacts on your images when they're finally developed. Always wind in the direction of the arrow. Number nine, don't force the advance of the film in the camera. It should be smooth. It should move out of the canister and across to the other side where it's being taken up. But if you suddenly start to hear something strange or feel something like ripping or grinding or anything like that, that is some sort of resistance, then you should probably stop what you're doing. You can really, really easily damage the film or even damage your camera if you try and force the advance of it. At that point, the best thing to try and do is either rewind your film completely if that's possible or to take your film into a dark space like a dark room and in complete darkness, open up the camera and try and assess the situation to see if you can fix it yourself. Or sometimes you can take it into a photo lab and they will more than likely have the ability to take the camera into the dark and possibly be able to salvage your film as well. And number 10, if you're shooting film, it has to be developed. And now I also shouldn't necessarily have to say this, but there's a lot of weird questions I get where people will be like, can I just open up the film after I've taken it and then I can have have the images it does only color negative film have to be developed can i does color reversal film like slide film just like come out when you take the pictures and the answer to all of that is no if you're shooting film if you're shooting 35 millimeter medium format or 4x5 or 16 millimeter or super 8 or just anything that isn't like a, a polaroid or an instax instant film then it has to be chemically developed a portion of which has to be done again in complete darkness it's how it turns exposed film into film negatives or film positives, depending on the film that you're shooting, so that you can see your images. After that, labs or different ways of doing it at home allow you to digitally transfer the images on the developed film into digital copies. But 
it needs to go through a developing process between this film and that result. Get your film developed. So those are my kind of 10 tips at the moment to hopefully help out some of you guys and answer some questions I've seen as well and expand on just like a little bit of knowledge as well if you're not too sure about certain things. And as always, I recommend you guys shoot film or get into shooting film or shoot more film if you can. Hey, thank you guys so much for watching and checking this out. And if there's any more topics and stuff in the future that you guys want to see, then you can definitely comment on the videos down below. And if you're interested in supporting the channel so that I can do bigger things in the future, then there is a link in the description of all the videos on the channel to the Analog Resurgence Patreon. You can head over there and check that out and consider supporting this stuff. It just makes it easier and more likely that I can kind of expand on more and more stuff in the future. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you soon.